Good afternoon. And um, I'd like to welcome all present and the viewing and listening public to this day 20th meeting of the Joint Select Committee on Land and Physical Infrastructure. I would like to advise that the meeting is being broadcast live on Alamans Channel 11, Radio 105.5 FM, and the Parliament's YouTube channel, Palview. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Dirup Kimal, and um, I have the honor and privilege to chair this uh, committee. And uh, I would like to invite um, members of my committee to please um, introduce themselves. We can start with those members who are present here, and then we'll go to, go to those who are attending virtually. Good afternoon, Chair, members, and uh, those attending. Simon de Nobrega, member. Good afternoon, everyone. Lisa Morris Julian, Vice Chairman. Good afternoon, um, every sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Renuka Sagram Singh Suklal, member. Um, are there are there other members who are online from the committee? Please. Good introduce. afternoon. Good afternoon, Anil Roberts, member. Okay, thank you very much, members, um, for your presence here uh, today. Um, the purpose of our meeting today is to commence the the committee's second public hearing pursuant to our inquiry into the various measures in place to address the challenges of climate change in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, our meeting today, we have officials from the Ministry of Planning and Development, Ministry of Works and Transport, Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, the Environmental Management Authority, Institute of Marine Affairs, and the University of the West Indies. So let me just remind everyone of our major project inquiries, uh, objectives, sorry, of the inquiry. The first one is to assess the impact of climate change in Trinidad and Tobago. Second, to understand the challenges faced in treating with climate change. And third, to examine the effectiveness of measures being taken to mitigate the impact of climate change. So those are our three major objectives. And um, I would like to ask uh, for introduction of the entities who are present here with us. And um, the format we would use is that um, at the same time, we would ask, I would ask for brief opening remarks from the chief officials present. So we'll go in certain order. First of all, um, the Permanent Secretary Acting of the Ministry of Planning and Development. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Just some brief opening remarks as requested. The Ministry of Planning and Development is indeed grateful to be involved in this follow-up meeting of the Joint Select Committee to discuss the measures in place to address the challenges of climate change in Trinidad and Tobago. The ministry continues to be supportive of this dialogue as the impacts of climate change and climate variability are already being felt in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Chairman, the meteorological records are indicating that ambient temperatures are on the rise and the intensity of rainfall is increasing, giving rise to unprecedented flooding and the associated damage to physical infrastructure, communities, households, and lives. The climate models project that we can expect these events to worsen over time. The projected impact are expected to be both direct and indirect on every facet of human well being and the resources that such well being depend on, such as agriculture, food production human health, water resources, and physical infrastructure. 
as small islands, Trinidad and Tobago stand to be more impacted in these sectors, such as in our coastal zone, where most of the socioeconomic activities take place. As you are aware, Trinidad and Tobago also accounts for relatively high emissions of greenhouse gases on account of its fossil fuel and industry-based economy. Addressing climate change holistically to reduce emissions as per the country's international obligations, as well as building climate resilience to adapt to and withstand the adverse impact of climate change are therefore not choices, but rather imperatives of development and sustainability. To this end, the national development process must therefore integrate all aspects of climate change in every sector so that climate resiliency is built across the board. To achieve this, the importance of data-driven strategies and programs cannot be overstressed. I would leave my comments there for now, and just to thank you for the uh, opportunity to continue to participate in this week. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, th thank you very much, Ms. Hines. Um, we go now to the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Works and Transport. Once again, good afternoon, Chairman and members. I take the opportunity to thank you for the ability to attend the second sitting of the Joint Select Committee on Land and Physical Infrastructure that is dealing with addressing challenges of climate change in Trinidad and Tobago. As that implementing our own of the government and the state, the Ministry of Works and Transport sees this particular inquiry as critical to the manner in which it goes forward in a number of areas that it has under its remit. The first sitting of the committee provided the ministry with a number of very useful insights from the various organizations. And we look forward once again to being able to contribute as well as being able to learn. And we see that this committee and the sitting should provide us with valuable insights. Thank Sorry, we go. Sorry, the mic was off. I um, didn't put it back on. We go now to the Permanent Secretary Acting, Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and to the members of your committee. Um, I just take this opportunity to be thankful for the, the um, second hearing of this joint select on physical land, uh, land and physical infrastructure as it relates to climate change. Um, I don't want to be long and I stand ready together with my committee to answer and to be part of this important discussion on climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Gulab Singh. Um, we go to Mr. Hayden Romano, uh, the e EMA. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. Um, thank you for the, giving the EMA the opportunity uh, to be present and to contribute to this important deliberation of the GSC on climate change. The EMA uh, will continue um, to be ready and able to assist in whatever way we can with the deliberations of this committee to make sure that we have fruitful discussions. So I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Romano. Uh, we go to the acting director of the IME. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the JSC and everyone present. Um, again, I thank you for including the IME in this um, inquiry, the second um, session of this inquiry into the um, various measures in place to address climate change. The IMA is a multidisciplinary marine research organization 
And for the past 45 years, we have been researching and monitoring our coastline and coastal ecosystem and providing advice on a sustainable management. Um, IME has produced a number of reports, books, policy brief, peer review publication, and most importantly, educational material used to raise public awareness and engagement in environmental management, including um, with respect to climate change and in its impact. IMA looks forward to the deliberation of this inquiry and the recommendations put forth, and we are committed to continue our collaborations with the agencies here to better prepare Trinidad and Tobago for the impacts of climate change. I thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Juman. Uh, we go to the Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of the West Indies. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Professor Michelle Maiku, Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. Um, I was also the coordinating lead author of the sixth assessment report by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, and in particular, the coordinating lead author for the Small Islands chapter. I'm also the De Deputy Executive Director of the Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development at the UWI. And I have been part of several teams at the campus working on scientific research to inform policy and practice regarding climate change impacts and adaptation to climate change. I'm really an adaptation expert in that regard. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank everyone for your 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 brief opening remarks. Um, uh, thank you very much for the um, for the intent that you have signaled to the committee. Um, I think um, the solidarity I've expressed with the work of this committee is noteworthy, and uh, we look forward to a very interactive and productive session here today. Um, I would like to remind both committee members and officials, if they can please direct questions through me, the chair, um, that, would, that would ensure effective, more effective coordination and would allow us to be a lot more efficient with our time. And also remind members and, and officials that please keep your microphones muted until recognized by the chair and all present should please utilize the raise hand feature accordingly. I know we are in the carnival season and some of you may be accustomed to waving your hand instead of raising at this point, but uh, we will stay with the raise hand feature for the rest of this meeting. Um, so I would open the floor to members of the committee to ask questions as agreed and um, I'll kindly request member Savram Singh to start our questioning here today. Thank you, Chair. You have me laughing with that jump waving hands um, <laughs> point. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity. Uh, Chair, through you, um, I have uh, just a few questions uh, uh, to the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Um, and uh, therefore, I guess, uh, well, again, through you, Chair, the committee will decide who is best positioned uh, amongst their representatives uh, to answer the relative questions. Um, the I firstly want to start by making reference, and, and through all the questioning, Chair, through you again, I'd be referring to the ministry's uh, submissions. Uh, that they presented to uh, our committee. Now, in their submissions, Chair, um, it was indicated that a draft strategic plan for the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, which includes elements to address climate changes currently being reviewed by the Honorable Minister and thereafter will be forwarded to the uh, for the approval of Cabinet. Uh, this chair is on uh, page uh, um, three of this question, answer to question five of the submissions by the committee. I just want to start the ball rolling by asking through you, Chair, the committee, if they can provide a status uh, um, update on uh, this draft strategic plan. And of course, Chairman, the period for which it is intended to cover. Uh, 
Ms. Kulam Singh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank, thanks to the member for the question. Um, yes, there is a draft strategic plan in going forward for the next five years, and it is going to be dealing with some aspects of climate change. I don't want to go into too much of it because currently the, the, the strategic plan is being vetted, right, before submission to the cabinet. So I, I would like to leave it there in terms of what would be proposed and what will be the final product of the ministry's strategic plan. Of of course, I can accept that um, understanding. Of course, that it has to be vetted. But um, can it is is it fair though to say that you all have made progress and you continue to make progress in moving that strategic plan forward? So therefore, in a short order, I don't want to commit you to a time, of course. But uh, you all, since the submissions have been made to now, um, can through you, chair, can can you all say that you have made progress? Uh, and you're almost there to having a final product? I, I, I would commit myself to say within the next two months, we should have a final product. Beautiful, yeah. Um, th thank you very much uh, for that. Um, for that, uh, you know, uh, submission, uh, Chair. Through you, uh, there are some questions that I have relative to enforcement and uh, the law bits. Uh, um, that were questions that were asked uh, in your submissions, and more particularly your responses. Uh, through you, Chair, I would like to make reference uh, to um, page uh, six of the Ministry's submissions. Uh, is their response to question six, and it's a question in which uh, um, uh, in, in the ministry submissions, uh, uh, they would have listed several factors that contribute to the lack of enforcement of laws uh, and uh, regulations. Now, in those submissions, uh, Chair, and of course, uh, to the ministry, um, I just want to go through, you would have listed primarily three um, uh, three difficulties uh, or factors, I don't want to say difficulties, but three factors uh, that contribute uh, to the lack of enforcement of laws and regulations. Um, the first one, for example, was understaffing at the forestry division, thereby hampering the ability to conduct proper patrols and other field exercises, right? So that, that was one of the challenges that the ministry recognized that they faced, uh, that you faced in the lack of enforcement of laws and regulations. Regulations. That issue of staffing. So, so if I if I am to address that first challenge that the ministry faced, uh, would you be able to indicate to me um, the number and type of staff that is needed at the forestry division um, to address uh, um, uh, to address understaffing? Thank you for the question. And through you, Chair, I will ask the conservator of forests, Mr. Denny Dipchan Singh, to take the lead on that question, please. Thank you, uh, Madam PS Chair and Member. Uh, Denny Dipchan Singh, conservator of forests. Um, so with respect to, to, to the question asked, um, the type of staff that would be necessary uh, are foresters and forest rangers. Uh, we have been very fortunate uh, over the last a uh, year and a half that we would have received the full complement of game wardens. Okay, yeah. And uh, also to assist us with staffing and law enforcement, the cabinet uh, would have approved 396 honorary game wardens. And honorary game wardens are given the same authority in legislation just as game wardens. They do it on a, honorary, on a, on a voluntary basis, sorry. And um, this project, this process has started to roll out as of last weekend. The Honorable Minister would have issued 68 uh, letters to Honorary Game Wardens to assist with the enforcement process. Excellent. I, be, I actually saw that on the newspaper. So that's why I just wanted a little more information concerning that. And uh, therefore, it's safe to say, or you envision um, that, uh, of course, this move by the ministry ought to considerably positively contribute uh, to you being able to treat with uh, the enforcement of the laws and the regulations. Uh, is it safe to say that? Uh, most most definitely it, it is a start in the in the right direction that we will we will definitely have some additional help with enforcement 
Now, in, the, um, in your written submissions, another challenge identified by the ministry, of course, through you, Chair, was that limitations in charging persons for offenses since forestry officers are not precepted. Additionally, in matters of squatting and illegal quarrying, the charges must be laid by the relevant agencies. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading this straight out of uh, um, your submissions, right? Um, uh, now, of course, I understand, uh, I mean, being a lawyer myself and from where I previously sat, uh, um, I, of course, I would understand the challenge that any um, law enforcement agent will face in not being precepted, right? A, a matter of security and all of those, those issues in particular. But uh, what I wanted to know is, uh, what I wanted to know is, uh, so for example, if I look, if we turn to the law, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the, the Forest Act. I'm sure, I'm sure you are, chapter 6601. Um, section 12, particularly of the Act, uh, speaks about the power of arrest. And of course, it says forest officers, rural constable and police officers may without warrant arrest any person having been concerned in a forest offense. So that's in a nutshell what Section 12 of the Act speaks to, right? Now, coming back to your limitation, the limitation of not being able to charge a difficulty is because your officers are not precepted. I just want to put on the record that Section 12 of the Act allows for police officers um, to assist in, of course, without a warrant, uh, in, in, in uh, charging and arresting persons who have been, uh, um, who, who may be found to be in the committal of an offense under the Act. How can you explain to me um, if, if within the ministry itself, in your division, if you all have a clear process map or, or a, a structure in place, a process in place, uh, where you can then rely upon the police to assist um, when it comes uh, to arresting and, and more so looking at, you know, and being able to accomplish what Section 12 of the Act intended to achieve. Is there any process map, um, uh, you know, if you could describe, for example, the relationship between the Forestry Division and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, particularly in addressing matters of squatting and, and even illegal quarrying? Right. Um, so thank you for that um, that comment um, to, to the chair and PS and, and, and thank you again, member, for that question. Um, so, so to get it clear, um, the forest officers, um, any forest officer, in fact, they, they are really empowered under three pieces of specific legislation. The Forest Act, the Sawmills Act, and the Conservation of Wildlife Act. Okay. So they are able to charge for offenses under these particular pieces of legislation. Um, you know, forest offenses um, sometimes have a, a wide cross spectrum, and you, you, as, you, as you mentioned, quarry and land clearing, right? So sometimes if you might, individuals that um, commit some of these acts may not be able to be charged on the Forest Act, and I will, I will have it explained to you in, in, the, in the sense that when it, sometimes you arrive at the location and the vegetation is removed or covered or buried, um, the evidence is a bit, you can't find the evidence. So it's difficult to charge them under that part of the legislation. So the wider legislation, for example, the no trespassing legislation, right? Which is where now you have to use the elements of the TTPS who are empowered under all the legislation. Um, we rely heavily on them. Um, yes, most certainly there, there, there's a, a, a great collaborative effort with the Forestry Division and the TTPS. There's a, a recently appointed a, task force um, through the TTPS that assists with, with illegal quarrying. And we have been hand on hand together with state lands officers and the EME working with them. Uh, notwithstanding that, uh, the joint patrols are also born with the ministry's previous larceny squad who are also empowered under the TTPS, as well as the EME, uh, I would say the EME police officers that are also empowered under the TTPS. So yes, there is that collaborative effort with the TPS and forestry to make these arrests. Uh, for my for my benefit, the benefits of the committee and of course the viewing and listening public, I'm very much interested in that task force. So that that's 
beautiful that's music to my ears um this task force that has been created so you're suggest you're saying that uh, there's a task force that has been created uh, specifically in the ttps uh, to lend this support uh would you be able to give me a little more information about that uh, task force because it's the first i am personally hearing about it and i, I think that's that's wonderful yeah, but I mean, the, the, uh, I, I don't know how much I could divulge with respect to the TTPS information. I mean, but the, the task force is, is, is headed by ASB Hayes. And right. I mean, directly liaise with the commissioners of state land and the forestry division in, in looking at these, these illegal offenses, especially with respect to foreign. And uh, since the commission of the task force, uh, um, have you all been able, you know, what uh, have you been able to charge persons or have the, the of course, the investigation has this con contributed significantly or positively to the gathering of evidence or investigations into these or, or alleged offenses? Most, most certainly. And uh, what we have done as well is that it has also allowed us to charge under our legislation for the illegal right. policies. Right. Uh, exactly. Now, if, uh, you know, so, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned, because it is so very true. I mean, there's uh, several pieces of legislation, of course, uh, that uh, will empower um, you and, and your officers, of course, the officers uh, with the ability to be able to charge. Um, but if we, for example, go to the Forest, um, um, the Forest Act again, um, Section 7, one of the Forest Act, uh, I mean, it creates a penalty of uh, $20,000 alone uh, for the removal of timber, right? Um, why I'm bringing up this issue is that inherent in, in the existing legislation, let's say the Forest Act, for example, and considering where you sit, uh, um, do you believe there may be a necessity to review the legislation now um, and perhaps with an eye to reviewing penalties um, for said offenses and looking, of course, at proportionality in accordance with the offense? Because, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, proportionality in determining to the offense, I mean, the, the, the amount someone is is required to pay, um, uh, I mean, that must be that must be weighed in uh, accordance with uh, uh, the offense that they have committed. And uh, to my mind, I mean, just uh, from a legal perspective, I find that, uh, I mean, 20,000, I mean, for the average man, it may sound like a lot, uh, but someone who is in the business of illegal um, timbering and so on, 20,000 is really like a little slap on your wrist and, and you could have a repeated offense. Uh, do you believe, uh, um, especially as it relates to penalties throughout various pieces of legislation, there may be a need uh, to review uh, those penalties uh, with the intention of at some point bringing legislative reform uh, with the intention of increasing penalties and so on and, and whether or not you believe also that that could play a considerable role in the deterrence and deterring persons from engaging in, in these offences. Uh, thank you again and, and again through you Chair and Member, um, really an, an excellent uh, question. Um, uh, the reality is that uh, at the when the Minister of Finance read the last budget, he had indicated that uh, he's going to review the fines and penalties um, for illegal timber. That's the exact terminology the minister used. And um, he was looking at raising those fines to $100,000 um, for the offense of, of illegally removing trees, which I, I, I would fully support because uh, to answer the second part of your question, definitely uh, higher fines would be a great deterrent. And I mean, if I can use, if I can use an example um, uh, with, with, with respect to um, fines that, that are used for, for example, environmentally sensitive species, um, if you were to hunt such a species or, or you are caught within your possession, it is $100,000 and two years imprisonment. And, and the beauty about that, that piece of legislation, it is part thereof. So if you're, for example, caught with a scarlet ibis or a scarlet ibis feather, you are charged the same, you, you are liable to the same fine. So yes, um, I, I, I really support additional fines and anything in legislative review that can be a deterrent. 
Uh, thank, thank you very much for that submission. Um, within the ministry itself, I would imagine that uh, you would also have your legal team uh, that is responsible, of course, for reviewing your multiple pieces of legislation and, of course, making the necessary recommendations. I'm asking that because, of course, uh, based on where I sit in a ministerial capacity, you know, we always welcome at least persons, of course, through you, Chair, you know, uh, persons like yourself who are on the ground, understanding the challenges from the ground, um, uh, you know, bringing forward those suggestions to us, of course, uh, following proper protocol through your ministries and so on, so that at least it can be incorporated. That is something that can be taken into consideration uh, by the ministry itself, uh, you know, as it relates to legislative reform and so on. Now, Chair, through you, I want to now turn to, um, again, to the submissions. It's uh, on uh, its question, the ministry's response to question 12. F um, in their submissions. Um, at that, uh, what was stated is that several policies and laws of relevance to forest management overlap and provide unclear management directives or in extreme cases are in direct conflict with each other. For example, if a person is found quarrying illegally on a forest reserve, the forestry division can only prosecute them for the trees they removed and the land management division and the Ministry of Energy would prosecute under their own regulations. And of course, this is this is critical because it's a part of everything we were discussing uh, previously where, you know, you may have one offense, but based on how the law is structured, only one, you may be able to charge uh, uh, the Ministry, the Forestry Division may be able to charge only up until a point. And for other aspects of the offense, you know, it may fall within the ambit. So other ministries, will they have the jurisdiction or local standard, as we call it in law, to charge. Now, based on that, that point uh, the ministry would have made in, in their submissions. What I want to know from you, of course, through chair, is what is recommended by the Ministry um, of Agriculture for treating uh, with this specific issue? Well, what is your recommendation in treating with this issue as alluded to in your submissions? That overlap uh, um, where several policies of the law of relevance to the forest management overlap all of that. What, what is your recommendation? In treaty cases. Ms. Gulab Singh? Yeah, I, I will direct that um, question to the um, Conservator Forest, to you, Chair. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And, and again, to you, Chair and Member. Um, so when, when we look at the, the different pieces of legislation, and as you rightfully said, overlap, um, in going back to, to the very first um, discussion, um, being precepted or having some of the officers precepted is a, is, a, is a step in the right direction, which means that they can now, uh, I would say, be able to take action upon the, on different pieces of legislation. Um, so that, that, that is one, one start on it. Um, the, the, other, the other issue at hand um, is really the powers um, of eviction. Sometimes when you, when you encounter individuals who are squatting, etc., and these powers really lie upon the, the commission of state lands. And and that is that is where the part of the law, if I can say quote unquote, becomes a bit tricky. So you might be able to charge for an offense, but you may not be able to evict the person. Right. Um, I, you know, you brought up again the issue of power of precept and of course to the benefits of the listening public and even the committee. Um, you know, just so it was identified as one of the challenges you all face in enforcement. But if you just want to remind us, why wh why would you advocate for, for officers or at least some of your officers having that power of precept? And of course, what benefit would it uh, would that redound to, you know, uh, the enforcement of the law? at least based on your experience and the experience of your officers. Right, so, so again, remember an, an excellent um, point for discussion. And the, the reality is that when officers are precepted, they are now able to lay charges on this, uh, different pieces of legislation. So if I, for example, um, were to get you in a forest offense um, or, or any individual in a forest offense, I could probably lay multiple charges if one is precepted. I can now lay charges for the illegal removal of trees, I can lay charges for, um, for, for trespassing on a forest reserve, right? Um, if I am not precepted, I could only now lay charges.
for the illegal removal of vegetation. Correct. So the precept now already gives you that wide cross spectrum to lay multiple charges. Correct. And, and it's something I know, but of course, I want it to be said and placed on the record because you see what what can probably be done then if, of course, this is where legislative reform would be required. And this is probably where the division now has to sit as a team and be able, of course, uh, to approach, you know, your line minister and your, your following the necessary protocols, making the said recommendations. You know, of course, before it comes to the office of the AG, there's a process uh, that it would have to flow and, and often times you would we, we all know that law is booted from policy and strong policy positions and uh, of course if this is a challenge a serious challenge that uh, um, or, or you, no, I shouldn't say a challenge, but if you do believe, if the, if, if the ministry is of the belief that this can certainly enhance in the enforcement of the law, I respectfully, true chair, would suggest that uh, we go to the drawing board, the ministry goes to the drawing board and, uh, you know, develop that po a policy around uh, that, uh, um, and, and of course, a policy which can support um, a, a legislator, you know, a, a, some sort of legislative reform that of course no doubt uh will assist uh, um would assist your officers now um is there a need for policies to clearly define management directives based on what is and this again is coming from your submissions that you would have made in response to question 12 f um is there a need for policies to clearly define management directives well i mean again again uh through you chair i mean at the end of the day um you know the, the legislation as you say would would, would would start to come out from the, the different policies that are made and i mean the the reality um with, with climate change, if I can tie it back to that, I mean, climate change, I mean, we have seen change drastically over the years. You mentioned that, I mean, you see it. I mean, dry seasons are drier, wetter seasons are wet, you have rain all the time, you know, and sometimes you're not sure if there's a dry season, but there's a rainy season. So you really see the impacts of climate change out there. And I mean, if you once you have strong, strong policies to follow, I mean, we can, it, it can do exactly what you're saying there lead to, to strong legislative uh, reform, uh, which can now um, empower us, um, you know, differently. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that submission, Chair. Um, I just have, do I have some time, Chair? Yeah, is, is it um, questions for the Ministry of Agriculture? Yeah, it's That's for the Ministry of Agriculture, Chair. One, one yeah. last question, Chair. Yeah, I'll, I'll allow it to continue, please. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, to the, through you, Chair, again, um, in the Ministry's submissions, uh, the Ministry indicated, this is in response to question 15A, um, the Ministry indicated that the penalties for slash and burn um, are not adequate and should be reviewed. Now, I, I am very grateful, Chair, that, uh, um, of course, the member of the Ministry would have tied in his submissions to climate change. Of course, the purpose of this entire um this entire GSC today is uh, you know looking at climate change and of course enforcement uh, plays a role a critical role in deterring factors that contribute to climate change and and chair you know of course through you that's why I'm spend I, I spend some time dealing with the enforcement part of it uh, recognizing that uh, you know with proper enforcement of the law uh you can deter um, actions uh, or persons from committing actions that no doubt contribute to the climate change. Now, back to back to what I was going to say. Um, in in the ministry submissions, chair, they stated that penalties for slash and burn are not adequate and should be reviewed. Uh, through you, chair, is the ministry of agriculture considering uh, revising the relevant legislation uh, to include higher penalty? Um, as it relates to slash and burn, is that at all a part uh, or something that is currently being considered um, by the Ministry of Agriculture? Yeah, Mr. Gulab Singh, would you answer or direct accordingly? Yeah, I will direct to the Conservator for us. Yeah, and thank you again, um, Chair and Member. Um, most certainly, um, these are these are issues I would say that we are looking at in in reviewing legislation. And I mean, and if I could, could 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 go to the point of slash and burn, 
I mean, it, it is always a, a, a tricky topic with, with legislation because the reality is that you have two things overlapping. One, you have vegetation being removed and you have fires being ignited. Um, so again, you have the lighting of fires, maybe illegally, out of, out of the, uh, the, the set period that you are allowed to light fires because there's a time frame that you can light fires out there. And um, again, the removal of vegetation. So yes, indeed, um, it requires, certainly requires review and requires um, higher penalties if caught. Okay. And uh, Chair, for now, that is, um, thank you very, very much to the Ministry of Agriculture for this, for your enlightening um, submissions. Uh, Chair, that is the extent of my questions for now, uh, posed uh, to the Ministry of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Member. Um, before, before we move off the Ministry of Agriculture, just to come back to one or two things that, um, <clears throat> in response to what was raised by a member, uh, Mr. Gulab Singh, um, in terms of the draft strategic plan, of course, um, I would understand the constraints that you have because the plan has not been vetted as yet. But um, taking into consideration, you know, the, uh, the whole issue of food security, that's one, um, particularly food security in the context of um, climate change and climate change ad um, adaptation and resilience, uh, particularly uh, adaptation and resilience, because we are early into the inquiry of uh, this inquiry and what the committee is realizing is that understandably so, over the years, a lot of emphasis has been on climate change mitigation. A lot arising out of the multilateral agreements that we have entered into as a country and it's only understandable that a lot of emphasis and most of the expenditure has been in that direction. But um, one of the objectives of this um, inquiry is very specifically to look at um, and to assess to where, where we are with adaptation measures and in relation to food security. Um, what, what, what I'm seeing is that um, where the Ministry of Agriculture land and fisheries would have to be a lot more a lot more involved a lot more proactive in terms of adapt uh, adaptation measures and um, within your within your strategic plan if you can indicate if if you so if you are so willing um, in terms of the organizational um, achieving the organizational capacity within the ministry to, to look very specifically at adaptation measures with relation to ensuring food security. Does your strategic plan address that? Thank you, Chair, for the question. And uh, yes, our strategic plan is looking at the whole issue of food security, um, not just for local consumption, but also for export. So we are looking at the local market as well as the, the regional markets. And uh, through one of our state bodies, NAMDEFCO, uh, they, uh, they play a very integral part in the whole farm to table. So yes, the ministry is looking at adaptation. And, and, and how we relate it in our strategic plan. But as, as, as I said, Chair, I, I really don't want to go into too much details with respect to um, formalizing what, what we want to formalize as the strategic plan to go forward to the Cabinet for approval. Yeah, I, um, the committee understands that, but um, for the purposes of our inquiry, you know, there would be subject areas under the strategic plan. And this is why I asked the question, because whether or not the ministry um, uh, within your current structure, uh, within your current uh, organizational capacity, um, to be looking at all of these aspects, particularly with regards to adaptation, are, are you envisaging the, the creation of a, a special, um, a dedicated, climate change unit or climate change division? Because 
what we have come across is the Ministry of Planning and Development have indicated to this committee that they are taking a note to cabinet to, um, to effectively um, sanction or to give authority to the Ministry of Planning and Development for directives to be given to the respective ministries, departments and agencies throughout the public service so that the necessary work that has to be done under the climate change mitigation and adaptation is done. So the fact that um, they are seeking a directive to be given, it signals that there is a gap and uh, whether or not the, 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 the setting up of dedicated uh, resources um, would be there in order to ensure that um, yeah, there's cross-ministerial coordination, cross-agency coordination amongst the respective uh, ministries and agencies to ensure that we are looking at this thing in a holistic way. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, so, so some of the things that um, we would like to see would be um, reforestation. We'll be doing a lot more outreach and that, that will capture not just farmers and not just the fisher folks, but also we want to also reach out as well to our youths. So we, we will be doing outreach in the schools, right, at the university level as well. And we would really want to strengthen our multilateral agreements and law enforcement, as we would have spoken to earlier. Okay. Um, could you confirm that the strategic plan that you have is for the years? You mentioned a five-year plan. Is it for the years um, 2023 to 2028? No, 2020, but we would have started it last year. So it would have been from 2022 to 2026. All right, um, okay, thank you. I, um, I see we have um, member Roberts with his hand up and also Dr. Rupnarain, so We'll take member Roberts first, and then afterwards, um, I'll go to Dr. O'Brien. Good afternoon. Um, I want to commend the Ministry of Agriculture. It seems like they, they've moved the, the Office of the Attorney General to the Ministry of Agriculture because the Ministry of Agriculture said that the Honorable Minister of Finance uh, said that they would raise the fines up to 100000 for various offenses and so on. And I was a bit shocked that the minister in the office of the attorney general was unaware of that, and the budget was read some five months ago. Um, to the Ministry of Agriculture, climate change, flooding, forestry, what has been the implementation of your ministry across Trinidad and Tobago to mitigate some of the uh, issues that occur, especially during the rainy season. Thank you. Thank you, Member. And through you, Chair, I will refer that um, question to our Director of Region South, who will be able to answer that. Uh, good afternoon. Through um, you, Chair and Member, and my Woman Secretary. Um, in terms of of um, flooding, the ministry uh, um, offers relief to um, the farmers who are affected by flooding, right? And this is done through um, there's a process for doing this through um, the extension officers, as well as uh, we have a, a digital we have a program that we use, which is um, the program by the Agricultural Development Bank. To, de to determine the value of these claims. So that is um, in terms of, of flooding, right? Um, in terms of, of um, um, incentives as well, we give, we, we provide a number of incentives to farmers like to cater for, for like, um, to use water more efficiently and so we, we do incentives for irrigation, we do incentives for pond construction, you know, so these things are directly 
link uh, the variations from climate from climate change. Agam, thank you. How many how many officers extension officers do you have, and how many farmers are they able to assess during flood flooding, and how many farmers have have received redress from the ministry or from the ADB program based on flood losses? All right, based on flood losses for, for the, I could give you the period for, um, for 27, for 2021 to 2022. It's there in the, in the answer sheet there, here in um, page 15 on the, let me see, on the um, question, I think it's question on, on page 15. You see there's a table there. Um, for the 20, 2017 to 2022, we, we, really, we gave relief to 4,716 farmers at a value of $41,407,250.54. So you see that in, um, in, part, in, in um, the response, uh, I think it's 10i, I'm not sure. Yes, thank you. I saw the table, but I just wanted you to read it out because to to us who live in the real world, ten million a year for flood damage to farmers sounds like pennies on the on the uh, uh, does not nearly compensate for the amount of damage that we see as we drive around or we look at the news and so on. So, how many people or how many farmers or what value do you think has been lost, or are you all of the opinion? That 41 million in four years for flooding some of the most devastating flooding that we've ever seen could come close to compensating or bringing people back to where they were before the floods. Okay, thank, thank you for your comment. Um, and it is true, remember the natural disaster is really a relief, it's not a compensation. So the, it, it is designed to, to kind of help farmers to get a to restart. It, it, it is not designed to compensate them totally for their losses. So that if, right. if, you, if you want to go in that direction, then yeah. we have to review. We have to review the program itself. Well, I would humbly suggest that we review that program because if I have a migraine headache and somebody rub my head, I might get a little relief. But I would prefer a strong Midol or a strong Panadol. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over to you. You remember, um, Dr. O'Brien? Thank you very much, Chair. I, I just wanted to, and through you, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions from the agricultural perspective as well. And I know that um, the PS indicated that she cannot uh, provide extensive detail, but nonetheless, I was just wondering if in the strategy itself, there was a consideration for things like innovation, with respect to things like, you know, we have the circular economy principles with waste management. There's this whole new project together with FAO, uh, looking at insect farming as creating a whole new livelihood for farmers, etc. And that's the first part in the innovative part. And following up from um, Senator Roberts' uh, questions or comments, and he mentioned something that was very important in my mind in terms of assessments, post-flooding events, etc. Do we have actual figures? of the amount of loss that is incurred or has incurred by, was incurred by farmers, sorry, in the last couple of years, maybe 2018 and 2021, where there was devastating floods. I think that would be interesting and instructive in helping us to understand the implications associated with climate change. And one last thing, is there or was there any consideration for the CARICOM uh, 25, 25 by 2025 uh, initiative included in the policy. And in terms of the payouts, you know that, well, our governments are assigned or part of parametric assurance, insurance issued by CRIF. And I was wondering if these payouts were received and if the ministry received, Ministry of Agriculture received allocations in order to pay, uh, you know, some sort of relief to farmers. So that's it from me, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you, question, member, and through you, Chair, um, I will pose the question to the Director of Press. Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, 
um, um, through, through your chair. Um, we, yes, we have records of, of, of um, the entire losses because remember the, uh, the extension officers have to go and verify losses right, that farmers, farmers claim. Right? Um, no, in terms of the CARICOM initiative, I'm not very, I'm not very, um, I'm not very so, cognizant with that aspect of it. So, uh, through you, Chair, um, with respect, with respect to what um, Mr. Rupnarain asked, member, we will have to get back to you in writing with respect to, because I am not aware that, that we got anything, any allocation for payment of that. Okay, so um, that would be submitted, Dr. Ryan, to the committee in writing. We, uh, we get that information to you. Um, thank you very much. Um, we would, I would like to um, probably move off um, for the time being, the Ministry of Agriculture. We come to the Ministry of Works and Transport. Um, member, member Dino Berger has a question, but before, before I ask him to pose this question, just to get the um, ball rolling with the Ministry of Works and Transport, is um, in, in, in the submission from the Ministry of Works and Transport, you all indicated that um, the Ministry of Works and Transport and its divisions, units and agencies, in some cases are responsible for championing said policies, frameworks or legislation, and in others provide critical advice and input as a key stakeholder. Um, this is a statement that you all made in your introduction, uh, the third paragraph on page four of your response to the committee. Um, would the ministry um, care to elaborate on the policies, framework or legislation as it relates particularly to adaptation responses for which the Ministry of Works and Transport and its divisions, units and agencies are responsible for championing. Um, Ms. Yearwood. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Ministry of Works and Transport is responsible for the adaptation of policies, frameworks, and legislation for the adaptation did identify that some of the area in particular that we see ourselves as championing would be the shipping bill 2020 um, and some of the policies you identified would have been those related to uh, the national transportation policy, the strategic drainage plan, the development of drainage guidelines and for developers. Um, Amendment to technical specifications for the conduct of road construction works and some of the frameworks we speak about in terms of which we see ourselves as uh, being a major driver would be those related to uh, the comprehensive national coastal monitoring plan and the shoreline management plan for city areas. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Francis. I would, I, I would now go to member Dean Africa. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, I, I would like to, to talk or to get some information on from the Ministry of Works with regards to mitigation of the impact of climate change. Um, and typically, we've seen that this is really higher volumes of, of rainfall and, of course, flooding. Um, one of the major uh, um, outcomes of that would be landslips and landslides. And I'm speaking now particularly from my position as a member of parliament. Um, unfortunately, we, in the past, we've seen a lot of the traditional solutions for this uh, being used, concrete, steel, stone, that sort of stuff. I'm wondering if the Ministry of Works can discuss and give us some information regarding um, green solutions, and particularly um, what green solutions they're looking at, um, given an idea of what sort of sustainable solutions you're looking at, and also whether those very same green solutions can be used as part of the coastal erosion issue we may have as a solution for that. 
Thank you, uh, member, through you, Chair. So the Ministry has been undertaking a number of instances uh, to bring solutions where it is practicable based on the soil type and the intervention required. Uh, we have had some success with different plant types as well as different uh, for formations. Uh, I, will, I will allow or I will ask the uh, director here to give some specific examples. Just to open by saying, this is an area that the ministry has been addressing, and it, we understand and we're very clear that solutions cannot simply range in the area of concrete and steel, as, as you would have stated. But we have as one of our actual goals in our strategic plan implementation of green solutions. So I'll ask that to feel like you will allow me to. A member of the chair, uh, the Ministry of Works over the past 10 years have been using some green solution, especially in the form of mechanically stabilizers. Um, what we have to do is use geo, geotextiles and long methods, which actually takes away from the normal, traditional, large concrete structures that we see. Um, to give you another example, we have a project on Moruga. In 2017, the cabinet approved over 21 masters. It was supposed to be done by another agency before I hand over to you. Three years later, there are over 80 landslips on this same over road. 50 of those landslips have been completed within the same budget, and it's because of using these green solutions. It is more cost effective. So sometimes we use a hybrid where we use the because of the type of soil, you have to have you have to have a your, your pile foundation. So what we do is use the pile foundation and on top of the pile foundation, we'll we'll bring this mechanically stabilized soil. So when you drive along the Moruga Road, what you would see is you wouldn't be seeing just a whole wall roadway for 27 kilometers, but you would see the mechanically stabilized soil which is grass, so you are seeing the, the greenery, and it's a lot more cost-effective. So as I said, today on Moruga Road alone, we have completed 50 landslips, we have seven ongoing, and we have 16 more. Yes, we need a little more money, but to be able to get to the price of 22 landslips, having been able to do 50 and have six ongoing, is to show the advantages of using green solution for two reasons. One, cost, and two, for the environment. And we have been using this throughout Trinidad for more than 10 years. What happens now is that the technology is changing, so we are going along and improving as we go along with the technology. Chair, if I may also allow for you, Chair, someone who are close to the question yet, to give you some example, um, where we have also used to light screen solutions. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon, Chair. Chair and the committee. Um, my name is Don Ambran from the Coastal Protection Unit. We have had some success uh, in implementing both green engineering and the use of nature based solutions. We have used nature based solutions in the coastal protection work at Quinam, and we have started planting. Um, sea grapes at Calo Pass Guayari. We have plans to roll out another project in south of Matanilla, which would use a vegetated dune. So that is a mix of beach nourishment and coastal vegetation. So it, it, as the committee member rightly pointed out, our solution shouldn't be limited to traditional engineering, the um, placement of concrete, steel, and stone. There are a lot more sustainable solutions that would work in harmony with the environment. Chair, yeah, if you'll allow me, um, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the times, the sort of hardscape solutions uh, may very well contribute to the problems themselves. Um, so I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, to, to the respondent from Pure, 
when you talked about geotextiles, am I correct in, in assuming that this is, uh, so the geotextile is used with all, with, with a vegetative solution. So the geotextile with grasses and trees and that sort of stuff. I just, I just want to clarify for my own understanding. What we do is build up the tail embankment by wrapping this geotextile, which is a fabric, with a certain type of soil or sand. And when this is so this is where you get the strength from. All right. And when this is finished, we then grass the slope, either with vegetable grass, or we use a sort of a coconut shell sort of layer, and then we plant the grass on this. So it's a combination of both. Chair, just I really just have one more one more question. Uh, and Chairman, I suppose you will decide who's the best person to answer for me, right? Um, again, talking about the impacts, on, and I'm talking about the impact now on our infrastructure, roads, our drains, retaining walls, bridges, etc. Um, is there any mechanism in whether it be Ministry of Works and Transport or Forestry or any other of the um, persons here today? Uh, with regards to monitoring what we would consider high-risk areas to identify um, issues at the early stages. And once and if there is, what is the reporting structure like? What is the reporting process like for us to be able to identify the impacts of flooding, um, high volumes of rainfall at early stages in order to address them at early stages as opposed to um, two years later, six months later, when you it's, it is a, a landslip or a bridge has collapsed or a drain has collapsed, that sort of stuff. Okay, so the mem member the Norberger is, is, is looking at um, the, um, in terms of um, risk, risk, risk assessment, um, monitoring and evaluation um so i uh, may, well maybe we can uh, i can ask the, the minister of works and transport to respond and then if there are any other stakeholders who uh, who want to contribute i i know there have been work done by the university of the west indies to some extent on um landslips by i think by dr Rupnarain, who has his hand up for a while now and also um I, I know in terms of coastal protection, um, the Institute of Marine Affairs would have looked at, uh, at, at risk assessment for coastal protection, also the Ministry of Works of Tra and Transport. But um, we could start off with the Ministry of Works and Transport, Ms. Francis Yewood. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Ministry of Works and Transport, Marine Ministry of Works and Transport is uh, at this point organized. It is organized in terms of the district system, both for our highways and our drainage uh, departments. And at district level, there is a responsibility by district engineers to monitor the roadway under our remit. Uh, and there is a reporting system from that, which is then placed into a wider risk assessment uh, program as well. Under our coastal protection unit, we do have an ongoing program, a project that started, I think it's approximately two years now. It is a comprehensive national um, coastal monitoring program, which sets uh, is seeking to do, I believe, exactly what uh, Member Norbert is speaking to in terms of working with the IMA and the AMA to have the requisite uh, equipment placed in such a manner that we can closely monitor what is happening along the nation's coastline. This is in conjunction with our um, critical coastal protection uh, program that we developed, where we did a total assessment of the coastline of Trinidad, and we developed a program out of that. Generally, I think we would have submitted that program as well to the committee, but we can do that. We can do it once again if required. So we have it both in terms of our district system, and we also have it in terms of 
seeking to put in place systems um, where we can automatically monitor certain areas. Okay, yeah, Dr. Obnarain. Thanks very much, Chair. I just wanted to add, well, kind of answer the question that was asked by the member before because I, I don't know I don't know if you all included ODPM, but they do a, a lot of the risk assessments in terms of understanding floods and landslides, and they would produce maps and they would have coordinations with respective um uh, ministries, etc. And WRA is really responsible for monitoring, particularly with respect to flooding events. And there is now a, a portal that they have in collaboration with the Met Office, uh, the ODPM. I think Ministry of Works is also part of it, that they could in real time access information to see what is going on at river levels and so on. And it is part of something called a CPUs project, uh, the Community Flood Early Warning Systems. And in addition to that, they're also looking at developing a multi-hazard early warning system so that persons could be uh, informed initially. And a lot of ministries or, or state agencies are part of that. So I, I think there's some action that is going along those parts that we should be aware of as a committee. And those are good in my mind. And um, the other thing that I wanted to raise or to ask in, in terms of the green or nature-based solutions, it's something that we are very much interested in at the university. But we are looking at it from a perspective of you know, the circular economy and climate change as a whole. So you should extend those things to perhaps things like green roofing, and um, you know, using the vetiver grass is good. And I know the member mentioned um, coconut matting and uh, geotextiles and so on. And there's actually studies to show that the main issue with respect to landslide is actually water management. So once you manage the water, you're fine. And you could have seen those effects recently. And the question is, are we looking at green solutions just for the for stabilization effects? in terms of landslides, or we are extending that to try to look at it as a general solution that could be implemented on community levels in terms of, like I said, green roofing, um, green water harvesting is also a factor that could be included as well. And the example that I want to put forward is the Manzalena stretch. Four years ago, the entire road was destroyed. It was rebuilt. And it was rebuilt seemingly without considering environmental factors which is why in 2022, it has been destroyed again. So that is something that we really need to be cognizant of as we go forward. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, um, Dr. Narayan, and thank you, Member Dean um, um, Member Roberts, you have your hand up. Thank you, Chair, to the Ministry of Works and Transport. Could you give me an idea of how many major rivers we have flowing into the sea, whether the Gulf of Paria, Caribbean Sea, or the Atlantic, and how much money is spent annually on dredging these river mouths? That's um, Francis Yewood. Um, there, there's the option as well, if you don't have the information readily at hand, that you could provide a committee with the information that has been requested. But if you have some initial information, we'd appreciate that. Chairman and member, thank you for the question. Uh, in terms of the exact figures, we will have to provide you, because I believe the member asked how much was spent every year on dredging. Um, Dredging the mouth of the rivers is a, is a very complex process. And it's not something that is done yearly. But we will seek to get the information for you and submit it in writing. Chairman, uh, at the same time, would it be possible to just press an intervention in respect of the Manzanella Ruby? Yeah, sure. You can respond to what um, Dr. Ryan was saying. Thank you. I'll ask the director. Chairman, for you. Um, the member said that we didn't consider environmental aspects. Um, when we did, we have to look at the history of Manzanella. 
It was first constructed as a road in 1942. It was built on sand, yellow rollers, and some macadam. Over the, this area that was normally affected, it's about 10 kilometers a road, which is like from the zero mile mark on the Manzalena Mayara Road to the Nar River River. The Nar River Swamp is a catchment that has 11 sub catchments flowing into it. Of those 11 sub catchments, there are eight entry points for water, rivers or so. This road, being a road, as I said, just evolved on gravel and sand. There are no, there was no, and before, four years ago, there was no outfall for the swamp. So the only outfall for the swamp was in the river river. Because of the increase in rainfall and because of this smallest global um, warming, etc., in 2018, we had this event. What this event did was over 2.7 kilometers of road, they had six breaches where the road was destroyed in these six breaches. What we did then, we worked with the University of the West Indies, along with a study that they did in 208. We worked with the White Fall Trust, we worked with our coastal department. So we did consider um, everything that all the information we have to be, have to be considered. One thing to note also is these 11 catchments has evolved over the years. So a road that was built with no outfall, fully swamp, when it's to overtop is on the road. So basically annually, every year that road floods. There's no roadside drainage and there's no outfall besides in a river river. So over the first five kilometers of roadway, what happened in 2018, the four bridges, we reconstructed only 800 meters of roadway. The solution that we did, if you go there now, you will notice all the reconstruction we did had stood up, which means structurally wise, we did the right job. But with the increase in the rainfall, the swamp just didn't take the water. So what we had now, in 2020, 2022 here now is three over 3.7 kilometers of roadway. We have 16 reaches now. Right now, we reach out to IDB, who is giving us some help technically. We have contacted the University of the West Indies, our coastal unit, our drainage unit. So we're not just going out there doing stuff like that. There's a lot of information. The IMA has given us a lot of information to work with. And right now, as I said, we are reaching out even to the IEB to do some modeling for us. But structurally wise, we know that whatever we did work, so we have an idea what we could do with improvements. There was a coastal study done in that area, and there are certain solutions that were supposed to be done with respect to revetments, et cetera. All that will be included in whatever new solution that we intend to do. I hope that would... Um... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me continue on the um, the point I was making about the dredging, please. And just to point on that, man, Zanilla, I heard a lot of solutions, but all your solutions have failed thus far. So I hope that you will take time with all of the consultation to provide solutions for the people of that area that will actually stand up. I'm not so sure. And next time I will ask you all about this increase in rainfall year on year. We're making categorical statements without any meteorological evidence. But back to the uh, dredging. Whatever period you do your dredging, Ministry of Works and Transport, whether it's by it's yearly, to, uh, once every two years or three years, please can you give us, if you cannot give us now, give us information on what was the average depth of water at the river mouth to, let's say, 25 meters outside of a river mouth 10 years ago, as opposed to now. Because I will let you know that I am an amateur fisherman, not a very good one, spend many hours out there and might get one little fish and so on. But I am out there sometimes in the night. And even in the Dago Martin River, 
you have to drive around your boat, which is two feet deep for the engine. You will have to go out at least 1.1 kilometers offshore or else you will run aground. Whereas 10 to 12 years ago, you could come much closer in to look for snook or for pag and so on at the night time. It is clear that the river mouths have not been dredged adequately. What is your position on that? And what is the effect of not dredging these river mouths? Because if we are saying climate change raises the sea level by a half inch or an, an inch every 10, 12 years, if the river mouths are not dredged and the water depth there decreases by eight inches, we will have greater problems on land. Ms. Um, Francis, I, would, I, I know you have committed yourself to providing the committee with um, information on the whole aspect of judging, but would you, would you care to respond to Member Roberts, any aspect of what he has said? Subject to, of course, the information that you will be providing to the committee in writing. Chairman, I, 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 I apologize for my hesitancy. I'm trying to find the question. Um, but based on the statement that was made, the ministry is in agreement with um, Member Roberts that the issue of the dredging of the river mouth is a critical issue. It is one that we have, we are looking at in terms of our 2023-2024 program. Um, we will seek to provide information that we have to the member, and we are hoping that it is an issue that we will be able to adequately address. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ms. Francis. No, the chair, Chairman, the question is quite simply, 10 years ago, what was the average depth of the water at the river mouth? You can use a, 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 a circumference or radius of 25 meters or so to give us. And what is the average depth at the river mouth right now? I am postulating and proffering to you that the river mouths now have become extremely shallow. And therefore, water flowing through the river courses backs up tremendously creating a problem on land of extra flooding. So, Ms. Francis, here with whatever information the ministry has on previous, um, previous levels, uh, current levels, and if you could also add in terms of your work program, say probably for the um, next five years, what are measures that the ministry is looking at probably under some of your projects, the PSIP, et cetera, um, in terms of the clearing of the river mouths and the dredging. So that um, <clears throat> the questions being asked by member Roberts would be answered um, as lucidly as possible in your written response to the committee. Okay, thank you. Um, um, member Sagram yeah, Singh? Hi, Chair. Yes, I know um, it was just really a comment I wanted to make, Chair, just to clear the record. Um, Chair, if if through you I can just clear the record about a, a comment that was made um, by one of the members of the committee relative suggesting that uh, um, this had to do specifically, Chair, with uh, when, when I dealt, when I spoke uh, uh, to the Ministry of uh, um, Agriculture relative to the point of penalties. And there was a suggestion, there was a suggestion by one of our committee members that suggested um, for some reason that the Minister in the Office of the Attorney General was unaware um, of certain fees and penalties uh, um, the, and the proposed increase to 100,000 just for the purpose of the, 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 of course, the listening and viewing public and, of course, as a matter of clearing the record. Um, I want to respectfully suggest, uh, one, that uh, the member probably need to, you know, have a look at the Hansard record of um, this particular meeting because there was no suggestion at all, Chair, uh, by my myself suggesting that I was unaware of the fees, one, and two, Chairman, um, 
of course, I'm very much familiar with Act Number 21 of 2022, um, which would have increased several pieces of which would have increased several penalties um, in various pieces of legislation, one of which, of course, was the Forest Act, uh, increasing penalties. Um, so it is just to dispel and to clear the record on the suggestion made by the member that suggests that uh, the minister in the office of the attorney general was unaware um, of that increase in penalties because of course this is a record this is a recorded um uh, uh jsc so i just wanted to clear jump in briefly and just clear that record chair and again thank the ministry of agriculture for you know showing their support for the increases of penalties and of course in their submissions recognizing the critical role um that the increase of penalties play in assisting in curbing, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, offenses that uh, no doubt contribute uh, to, to climate, you know, it, uh, offenses that contribute to climate change. So th just thank you very much uh, for that, um, for that opportunity to briefly intervene to, to clear that record. Thank you very much, Member um, Professor Michael. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to highlight that the, in terms of the university's capacity, um, we do have a colleague who is Dr. Vincent Cooper. He is one of the top hydrologists that worked in the drainage division many years ago, but he has also been involved in capacity building and research and training. Um, he deals with hydrological modeling and, and so on. So in terms of an expansion of our team, I would like to suggest that we um, involve or engage Dr. Cooper in the next rounds of meetings. He is highly trained and very accomplished as a researcher and practitioner. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Ma uh, Michael. We actually, this committee did engage with uh, Dr. Cooper a couple of years ago when we had an inquiry into um, the alleviation of flooding for some of the major river basins, river catchments in the country. And I agree with you. He, he, he made a tremendous contribution to the work of the committee. So I would I welcome your suggestion and we ask, the committee would accept having him present at the next um, public inquiry. So um, the intention is that we would finish at 4.30, but um, I really want to get the, the Institute of Marine Affairs into the discussion. But before, before, before we do so, um, just to come back to the Ministry of Works and Transport, um, and particularly in terms of the strategic drainage plan that has been referred to, I think that has been done through CAF. And um, um, the committee understands it's a fairly voluminous um, uh, P, uh, study, very extensive. It's, na it's national in its nature. And um, we, will be, we will be signaling to the Ministry of Works and Transport that we need as much information as possible in terms of the findings of that particular um, strategic drainage plan. And, uh, but what I would like to ask is that in the context of the plan itself, how, how much has, is the plan Akura with the climate change reality that we are in? particularly with regards to the change in rainfall patterns, the change in rainfall intensity. Uh, we looked at the development of um, relevant um, uh, concurrent, um, current um, rainfall uh, frequency intensity curves. How, how much um, up to date is this drainage plan with the reality of the impact of climate change with regards to um, rainfall and all of these things. I see Chairman, Chairman, through you, I'll ask the director of should just give a view on you. Good afternoon, Chair, and I'm um, With regards to the strategic drainage plan for the ministry, that we have to remember that plan was originally based on the studies that we have existing, and those studies were all the studies 
that would not have had um, this level of climate change and the adaptations in them based on the fact that they would previously to 2020, 2010, 2014, all that time. So what we have done with the study that they gave us with the list of priority projects, we have to take into consideration when we are prioritizing and developing those studies and those um, projects, we now have to build, build in our own uh, mitigating factors for climate change into them before we present them as um, final projects to be done. So we're taking these suggestions made by the uh, strategic drainage plan when they come out of the plan. Um, we are continuing those studies in the areas that we have gaps. And when we get the, that new information, we'll now be able to be a better, in a better position to have our studies more equipped and a little more robust based on the, the present fields that you, you, that you did mention as well. So the plan really was just to study the, um, all the reports that we already had. Now the other 50% is what we're working on in conjunction with the plans and the projects that came out of those studies. So the short answer is we really do have to build in some mitigating factors based on now the kind of change that we have been seeing and the more increase in an intense rainfall um, in the projects that are emanating out of the plan. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much for your response. But um, um, there's a couple of questions coming out of what you have said. Is, is, there, is there any priority that has been established by the ministry now coming out of that strategic drainage plan in terms of prioritizing um, certain catchment areas, like um, maybe the, the South of Rapuja River Basin, um, certain... Um, where there is um, prevalence um, in my arrow area, what, um, what priorities are being given to those high prone um, flood areas in, in connection with the strategic approach? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for that um, question. Uh, yes, we are trying to focus on the priority areas um, that have experienced high level of flooding. But um, as we will see, we have to take it one area at a time. Um, we are focusing on the central area right now. And most of the plans for this, with this displacement that we would seem to be getting now would be focused along the parent area. So that is the major focus right now. And also, um, we have to continue studies in the Spain area, um, St. Anne's area, where we have gaps. So we are focusing on the areas. Unfortunately, um, South Europe, which is one of the areas we have focused on, the projects coming out of those would also include looking at um, expanding on Yucca Channel. All those areas, we have to still have proper implementation um, fleshed out. We can't just go and start the project just like that. So I know um, we are aware that um, Dr. Cooper as well um, is currently involved in projects along the South Rivers area as well. So we didn't want to duplicate too many efforts on that area. So we are focused right now on the parent base and the first instance. All right, the, the reason I'm persisting with the line of questioning, questioning is that um, well, you know, the committee is fam familiar with the, um, because of the previous flood alleviation inquiry we did, um, I think it would have been two years ago, two and a half years ago. There's a proliferation of studies outside there. Um, so many studies that are outside there, but um, a lot of the solutions within those studies um, are so capital intensive the, the, the works that are, have been identified um, uh, calls for exceedingly high um, capital expenditure. And we understand that has been a deterrent for undertaking some of the major works um, over the years because we see a pattern over the many years that um, drainage and drainage solutions have basically been trying to just, you know, maintain because it's cleaning of rivers, cleaning of drains, 
you know, um, construction of box drains, but major drainage works for some of the major catchments, you know, have been eluding us over the years. So it's just that in terms of now that we seeing a strategic drainage plan and taking a strategic approach to the whole thing, um, could you could you indi indicate to us um, your your thoughts on this and um, if if it's influencing how you are going about providing the necessary solutions? Thanks, Chair. So um, from our point of view as a ministry, of course, we have to look at the cost of all the implementation of the projects. And unfortunately, in some areas, it's um, it's a mixture of planning as well as implementation. So when I say planning, I mean ministry of planning. So um, we all have to come together. It's not the strategic drainage plan. It's not just the ministry of food plan. It really involves all the different agencies and ministries coming together to implement policies where we have um, people building too close to water courses, people building on embankments, people constructing in, in major flood prone areas. So all these things have to be considered, not just building drains as you put it. Um, we, we really not um, the, the division involved in building the drains, etc. We are really pretty major forces. But the strategic way we are looking at this is how do we prevent people from being impacted in this space? So what we can do with our, um, our projects, our major plans, is try to improve on the areas that we have embankment works to be done, firstly, and also to look at the overall area and why is it flooding? Why is it continuously flooding? Is there mitigation things we could implement? A lot of the areas that we see repeated flooding is um, areas, unfortunately, where the water is supposed to spill. It's a flood plain. So when we have construction in there and more and more developments in those areas, it leads to um, perfect uh, area, um, flooding and damage. And it was only when people are in the floodplains when the damage actually occurs, that's when you see the effects of it and it becomes a disaster. Now, when people are in there and they know they're in a floodplain, they're supposed to be constructed or mitigated damages as, in, as part of their own safety. So in areas where we cannot, some of these, these suggestions were start with, in the studies will relocate villages, relocate all, all the areas in people where people are affected, but um, really and truly that can't happen in this day and age. So now we're looking at capacity building, which is just to increase the water courses to hold it. Also to increase, as member um, brought forward before the dredging of the river mouth, that will help the water flow much faster. And even fixing our own gauge structures and all those um, water structures that help and control water runoff. So all these areas that we are focusing on, we have to do it in a, a systematic way. We can't just jump into one area and then leave that to another area. So it's from top to bottom, from in, flow, and out. We have to look at it from a holistic point of view. Again, not by ourselves, but with in, involving the other ministries as well. Okay, thank you very much, Acting Director. So I think what, what you're saying makes a very um, comprehensive case for getting our integrated water resources management uh, um, policy up and running. Um, Member Roberts, you have your hand up. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry, just before you go to the IMA, I have a very important question for the engineers at the Ministry of Works and Transport. On the Joint Select Committee record since 2017, the government and WASA has said that there, be, there, there has been approximately 4 bu bu billion gallons of water go being lost under our roadways and our, uh, our rock formations and our land for the last six years. The leaks continue without abatement. What sort of damage or impact with this amount of water, 4 billion gallons of potable water 
under our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, as we see across Trinidad and Tobago, sinkhole after sinkhole, devastating potholes, roads being damaged, collapsing and so on. With this water, man-made clean potable water that is leaking under our infrastructure, what effect would that have on our infrastructure? Okay, uh, Ms. Francis, here, would you all have any direct information um, regarding um, damage, damage to your road network, uh, damage to infrastructure arising out of um, WASA's operations? Uh, Chairman, uh, we have stated in the past that the, uh, any water under the infrastructure will damage the integrity of the roadway. Um, in terms of actual, uh, if we are speaking towards kilometers of roadway damage, or is it from a financial perspective? Um, a cost, yeah. Yeah, maybe a cost perspective. From a cost perspective, Chairman, yeah, that, that is extremely challenging um, to quantify. Um, if it is that we are given or a specific rule is identified, we, we would be able to provide you with some indication over a given period. Okay, well, Chairman, whatever that's... Chairman, not across, the, not across the perspective as such, that could be given in writing. But in engineering terms, what is the source? We are talking climate change and we're talking about flooding. If also our water, our aquifers, our, 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 our rocks, our hillsides under uh, the foundation of our roads, if it's already saturated before the rainfall comes in the wet season, doesn't wouldn't this exacerbate the damage one by four? creating more flooding, and two, by weakening the integrity of our infrastructure. I want a sort of engineering perspective on that theory, please. As Francis here, would, um, would anyone on your team um, here to, um, would want to provide any information for the member with regards to the um, engineering um, aspect um, in terms of um, the risk for damage? The chairman, we can, we can probably give you a statement from a purely fair point of view, yes. Um, okay. Um, okay, thank you. Um, sure. before... Yes, chairman. Yes, um, sorry, before we go to, um, doc, uh, before we go to the IMA, um, I see Dr. Rupner, and you have your hand up. Yeah, just, just a quick thing. I, um... Very interesting conversation going on. I just wanted to know in terms of the drainage plan, has it been completed or is it still in the process? I don't know if I missed that in terms of the explanation that was provided earlier. And just in terms of how we are managing flood and water in general, it seems that our focus is very much on the symptoms. So like when you go and you deal with the dredging of a river, you go to the area that is actually being flooded out. That is the symptom. The causes are uphill. And I have heard very little in terms of, you know, reducing the runoff rates and water getting to these catchment areas in such a quick time. In hydrology, we speak about it in terms of reducing the lag time, yeah, or increasing the lag time so that the river could drain efficiently. And I keep hearing we are dealing mostly with symptoms and not necessarily with the causes of flooding. So just wanted to, to clarify those things and to put that point forward. Thanks, Jay. Right. Th thanks very much, Dr. Rupnarayan, which is why I was asking. I, I think it, it probably didn't come across so clear is that um, for the Ministry of Works and Transport to crystallize some of the key aspects of that um, strategic drainage plan, particularly in terms of um, along the lines that you are mentioning there, because, you know, like um, detention basins and all of those things. Um, the rainwater harvesting and all of those things that would contribute mm -hmm. to minimizing runoff or delayed um, entry of runoffs into the channels um, to help with the with the problem. Ah, Ms. Uh, Ms. Durga, would you um, would you just care to um, inform Dr. Rupnarayan as to the completeness of the strategic drainage plan? Is it a completed exercise? 
um, chair. That's um, unfortunately, it's a living document. Remember that drainage plan will change according to the studies that we continue. So from the information we have right now, based on the 50%, as I mentioned before, we have the priority projects listed. And as we continue studying the rest of Trinidad that we have identified gaps, that information will feed back into the, the original plan, and then all the projects could be reprioritized in that way. That's why we never said that the, the, the plan is complete. There is a plan, but the, the plan remains a living document, always changing as we feed it more information. Because based on that, then we would know in which direction we need to, we need to go. Um, we didn't mention um, green water harvesting and all that because, quite frankly, that is just a part of the, the um, solution that may be posed to different developments. And I, I know Dr. Clare would have bring that, brought that up at a different forum, um, particularly last year. See, I think he did mention that. And that has to be at a developmental level. That would be for each development, they can choose to have that rainwater harvested. They can choose to store the water, but we do encourage that with the developments that come to us for approval. We make sure that the post development flow doesn't exceed pre development flow. That simply means when you put a development up, you don't increase the runoff to the um, water course nearby where it needs to go. You would have to have a certain amount of storage in your um, development. And if you choose to have that storage as rainwater harvesting, that will still be a minor amount. That would contribute major amounts to the water course as well. So again, that is part of um, planning, Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Woods. It's, it's a um, joint effort. And I know he would be alluding to hillside development as well which um, unfortunately is under order. So, <laughs> okay. so, um, judging, uh, judging from the expression on Dr. O'Brien's face, I know he doesn't fully agree, but uh, <laughs> uh, that may be it we have to get into at some other forum. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Um, and um, just to, we have, uh, to, to get to the IMA, the Institute of Marine Affairs, <laughs> And just to get things uh, moving, um, to just ask a general question with regards to your integrated coastal zone management program as to the general direction or the specific direction of that, um, that policy, that, that um, initiative, uh, where we are and what are your major challenges? Question. So IMA would have um, chaired a steering committee to develop an integrated coastal zone management policy framework strategy and action plan back in 2012. The draft policy was first submitted to the ministry at the time in 2014, right? In 2017, uh, interministerial committee was appointed to finalize the policy. That policy has been finalized and has been submitted to the Ministry of Planning and Development. Um, it was submitted in 2020, and we are still um, awaiting cabinet approval on that policy. All right, but um, the, the Ministry of Works and Transport, based on their response to this committee, has a very extensive coastal protection program. In fact, um, it consumes a lot of um, expenditure and they, they, um, they are undertaking specific projects. Is there a degree of coordination between, um, the, between um, the Ministry of Works and Transport, what they set up as uh, priority projects um, in relation to your integrated coastal zone uh, program? First of all, the Integrated Coastal Zone Program is not an IMA program. It is a Ministry of Planning and Development Program, and it's an integrated... Oh, and it's also the, ministry, the Coastal Protection Unit out of the Ministry of Works and Transport has been a member of the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Committee starting way back in 2012. So there have always been that integration. The intention of the committee is to do what we've been speaking about today, for us to work together and collaborate to address problems that are, you know, that, that crossed a wide sector, spatially, temporally, and different types of, ec and economically. 
Okay. Um, um, how far are we in terms of that special um, special aspects? Um, is is the IME um, advanced in terms of any designated uh, special planning areas? So land use planning is normally done by the Ministry of Planning and Development. The IMA, however, is beginning a process to do what we call marine spatial planning. Um, and this is to basically look at the environment and the activities that are occurring there and how we can properly um, manage those activities so we could start um, stop, you know, causing too much damage or we could encourage economic growth without affecting significantly some of the ecosystems that exist in our marine environment. Okay, um, would you, would you um, like to just um, inform the public and the committee in terms of the research being done, well, at least some of the research being done by the IMA, particularly with, terms, with, with regards to projections for um, increasing, um, in, increasing, um, increasing in, in, in um, Coastal the wave heights um, to the to those coastal regions, increases in um, temperature, water temperature, and the impacts. Um, are you much involved in that in that type of research, and does it inform you know the hard projects that are undertaken yes. to address? Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry about that. Sorry, thanks for the question. So the IMA this coastal monitoring program has been monitoring our shorelines, our coastlines, beaches and base throughout Trinidad and Tobago. We've been collecting what we call beach profile data, as well as um, littoral data, stuff like wave heights and so forth. And that is done routinely. And that information is made available to all state agencies upon request. We also pre prepare reports and so forth that we submit to agencies and we make public. In addition to the coastline monitoring, we also monitor coastal ecosystems, our mangrove forests, our coral reefs, our seagrass beds, our coral, our coral reefs in particular are susceptible to impacts of climate change, particularly elevated sea surface temperature, which causes coral bleaching. And we've been experienced already two massive bleaching events, one in 2005 and the other in 2010, where we had mass coral mortality and limited recovery of our corals. So we also have um, in a, we have also collaborated with the Climate Change Center out of Belize and have installed what we call coral reef early warning systems, which are basically um, water quality buoys that collect um, physical parameters such as temperature, pHs and so forth that um, helps with our monitoring program. And again, that information um, the, from the coral reef early warning system, it actually feeds into the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency um, data set where they, where, where they issue coral bleaching alerts for the region. So it, it feeds into a wider regional uh, monitoring program. So yes, and our data is made available upon request and through reports that we prepare, such as our State of the Marine Environment reports and other technical reports that we make available to our agencies. Okay, thank you very much for that response. Um, in terms of the coral bleaching, the, um, you mentioned two major incidents that took place. Um, uh, were, were they in uh, Tobago? Um, yeah. Are related to the Boko Reef? Well, it's related. So most of the reefs in Tobago was impacted, for especially with the second um, bleaching event where we got bleaching occurring even deeper, like in Speyside. So we have a. Uh, we worked with the Tobago House of Assembly as well as other stakeholders to um, develop a coral reef bleaching response plan so that when folks observe coral bleaching, they can report it to us. And then we would investigate and monitor um, after a bleaching event to see whether there is recovery or mortality and in terms of even the health of the coral reef. So one of the things we have observed after a bleaching event is more coral diseases, occurrence of coral diseases. So the reef become even more susceptible to um, pathogens and so forth. So yes, we we monitor and we make that information available. Okay, yeah. But, um, other than the um, identify, identification of the bleaching and the monitoring of the bleaching events, um, 
are, are, are there um, adaptation strategies that the Institute have um, looked at and um, uh, the possibilities of having any implemented? So, well, the IMA is research, so we provide advice. So in developing the integrated coastal zone policy, the intention is to build an adaptation to climate change. But with regards to coastal ecosystems in particular, our intention is what we call building coastal resilience, um, the ability of these ecosystems to resist some of these impacts. So in building resilience, we have to be able to remove the impacts we have control over. So things like pollution, um, which is already impactful on our ecosystems, if we could address those those kinds of issues, we can make our um, ecosystems more resilient to impacts from climate change, which we have very little control over. So yes, and the other thing that we're looking at is in terms of rehabilitation um, for coral reef and seagrasses and mangrove forests as well, how we can rehabilitate these ecosystems. Right, um, <laughs> Dr. Jovan, you anticipated uh, member the uh, question that was coming at you because he was now asking about rehabilitation. So we're glad that you, you mentioned that um, it's within your radar as well. Yeah, so I would ask him to... Um... Thank you very much, Shane, through you. Uh, doctor, can you tell me, one, if there are any species of coral that um, are more, uh, I suppose, uh, are, are better suited for it, rising sea temperatures, um, and if and what is the IMA's role in uh, regeneration and rehabilitation of the coral reefs in particular, and if you're looking at, if you're looking at any particular uh, species of coral? So in Tobago, we do, besides just the coral bleaching, we do routine monitoring of our coral reefs every year, and we look at, um, you know, in terms of coverage, hot coral coverage and so forth, and what is happening in our reef. And we're basically seeing where our reefs are um, decreasing in hard corals, that's the reef building corals, and you're seeing other macroalgae and soft coral species and stuff dominating. But in monitoring the hard, in monitoring the coral reefs on a regular basis, we can determine which ones are more susceptible to like bleaching events and coral diseases and so forth, and which ones tend to be more resistant to, to those impacts. So some of the, the, um, the plurias or the brain corals and star corals and so forth. Um, in developing the restoration plan, some of the things that we look at is coral recruitment which ones are actually recruiting. So earlier last year, we were actually looking at coral spawning, um, trying to document the spawning events so that we could um, look at what species are spawning, how they settle, how they survive, um, with the intentions of actually utilizing those for rehabilitation um, procedures. So I, I wonder if I answer your question. Yeah, the member is shaking his head in agreement. I think you have answered him quite well. Um, thank you, Dr. Juman. Um, one final question before we close um, to you. Um, your submission you indicated that the many laws and policies impacting on coastal areas give rise to as many as 29 institutions having a defined legal and or policy role in aspects of coastal management. This creates problems such as overlapping jurisdiction, the independent syndrome, and a lack of proper coordination of the work of enforcement and management agencies. Any thoughts on how this uh, challenge could be addressed? So in developing the integrated coastal zone policy, we had um, Dr. Narendra Ramgulan, um, God, his name. Um, he actually did a gap analysis looking at the legal and institutional framework for coastal zone management and climate change adaptation. And basically, he identified all the policies, all the legislation, and all the agencies that has um, an impact or has a, a, a role to play in coastal zone management. And in the, that is one of the first um, strategies, actually, within the 
integrated coastal zone policy is in terms of having that coordinating mechanism amongst the different agencies. So we all meet and treat with the problem and not deal with it um, separately, because sometimes that is, um, you know, not the right approach. So it's, the first thing we need to do is basically have that integrated, um, coordinated cooperation among state agencies and all the other agencies that have some sort of stake in the coastal and marine environment. But the, um, the, the, the proposed solution is, is, um, is what um, is affecting our coordinating agency, coordinating body. What, what, the, what does his um, work identify? So um, some studies were done and we're looking at um, agencies with capacity and what agencies should be um, you know, either um, upgrading particular agencies to have that coordinating role or creating um, like a sort of a commission with, with state agencies that would have that dis decision-making um, ability, but basically to coordinate all the um, coastal issues, right, by all state agencies so that there's that, that cohesive approach to management. Yeah, thank you. Would it be possible for you to, um, to provide the committee with a copy of that report that was done? I could um, submit that report, yes. Okay, thank you very much um, for your responses. And um, I would like to uh, bring this uh, public hearing to a close. Um, um, in so doing, I would invite um, the respective um, entities that we have present here today for your uh, brief um, closing comments. So we'll go in the same order that we started. <laughs> uh, Ms. Hines, Ministry of Planning and Development. Thank you, Chair. This has been an insightful in a number of ways. I, uh, it was very interesting for the Ministry of Planning to listen to the contributions of our colleagues, particularly the challenge we all face in terms of enforcement and coordination. And again, we are committed to supporting our sister agencies in whatever it takes to ensure that the overlap and the duplication and the non-performance in many, in many instances does not continue to occur. So we look forward to continue to work to solve some of these challenges. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Hines. Um... Ms. Francis Yearwood, our Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Works and Transport. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, once again, Ministry of Works and Transport is very thankful that the committee has asked us to be here this afternoon. It continues to allow us to understand and to collaborate with our fellow um, agencies. Um, we continue to recognize the importance uh, of ensuring that the work that we do is in keeping with the requirements of this time. We, even from the very first uh, meeting, we saw the need for greater collaboration with the University of the West Indies, and this is something that we will continue to pursue. Um, once again, Chairman Thai. Thank you very much. Ms. Uh, Gulab Singh, our Acting Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and to your members. Um, I just want to say that this meeting is really eye-opening. And uh, yes, I, I would echo the same sentiments of my two um, peers. In, in the Ministry of Planning and in, in the Ministry of Works where we need to really do more collaboration because at the end of the day, we are here to serve and to serve in respect of government's policy and implement those policies. So we, we need to really integrate more and collaborate more. And, and with that being said, I really want to thank the you chair and the committee for allowing the Ministry of Agriculture to be part of this most important inquiry because climate change is a reality. So thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Romano, Managing Director of the EMA. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and I want to support my colleagues uh, with respect to the, the, how informative this session has been today. I would also like to remind you know, all my colleagues that we do have a national environmental policy. And one of the priorities of that national environmental policy is addressing climate change and environmental and natural disasters. Section 31 of the EM Act is very clear that all of us, all ministries and agencies must comply with the national environmental policy. And therefore I urge all my colleagues in doing their strategic plans that they ensure that they are aligned with the national environmental policy. Thank you, Chairman, members. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Romano, for that and um, your timely reminder. <laughs> uh, Dr. Juman, Director of the IMA. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being part of this um, deliberation. The IMA remains committed to provide the data um, needed for ev evidence-based decision-making. Um, that is our purpose. We're a resource and we're available and we're willing to work and collaborate with all agencies. Um, in moving forward as well, we also have to ensure that we collect the kind of data that is required by state agencies for decision-making. So developing a national research agenda, I think is going to be critical. So again, we're open and willing to work with everyone in the best interest of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Juman. Uh, Professor Michael from the Urban and Regional Planning Division at U UWI. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, again, a very interesting meeting today. Um, I just want to return to the purpose of the setting up of this Joint Select Committee. It's obviously you know, addressing the issue of land and physical infrastructure and how we adapt to climate change. Um, I think we are quite familiar with the fact that, yes, you can build your way out of problems by, you know, investing heavily in infrastructure to, um, to, to ameliorate flooding. But of course, there are other adaptation measures such as land use planning, the zoning and enforcement of the regulations to protect our watersheds and forested areas, obviously. And of course, Dr. Juman has referred to the value of ecosystem-based adaptation, which is the um, protection of the coastal zone from coastal flooding, looking at coastal ecosystems such as the coral reefs. And um, she's an expert in wetland restoration, but she knows the value of um, mangrove restoration. Um, what I would like to say though, is that we need in, in this committee to address the agility of the governance system whether we are able as um, public agencies to develop partnerships that can respond in a very agile way to the flooding, flooding we are seeing. And of course, this involves um, dealing with harmonization of legislation and building capacity for implementation of various policies and projects and enforcement of the legislation. I say this in the context that the science is saying we have a very narrow window of opportunity to respond to climate action um, and the challenges and impacts of climate change. It's very urgent. The, the IPCC report says, um, with, if we don't deal with this within the next 10 years, we are going to see a worsening of the climate change impacts. So I would urge in terms of the agencies present to be aware that the window is of opportunity is shrinking. And if we are going to um, access adaptation finance, we need to um, have sound empirical evidence, which comes from scientific investigation. And in this respect, the university stands ready to give service in terms of robust science that can inform your various policies and um, implementation action. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, <laughs> So let me, on behalf of the committee and the secretariat, um, thank everyone who participated today in this uh, public inquiry. I, I, I am of a view that we had a very uh, productive uh, session here today. I think um, there was a lot of information flow, and I think the spirit in which um, persons contributed to the discussion 
um, would definitely be of uh, value to the committee as we continue to deliberate on this very, very important aspect of our national development, our national resi resilience, and if I may go so far as to say our national survival. So thanks everyone very much for your contributions. Um, the Secretariat would be in touch with, with, with all of you, those who would have given on the tickets for providing information on in writing. And also um, we, we trust that um, should we be seeking further information coming out of the discussions today, that you would continue to give us your the full cooperation that you have given thus far. So thank you once again. Um, I'd like to thank our viewing and listening audience on the respective media channels, um, all members of the committee, and uh, to thank very much the parliament staff, the broadcast team, and to thank um, our hardworking secretariat headed by Mr. Johnson Greenwich. Thank you very much. I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's quite